Welcome to your tutorial on data visualization in SPSS. First, we'll look at making histograms. All right, the first graph I'm gonna show you how to make is a histogram. Um, so you might've noticed that you can get the histogram uh, just in the outputs of uh, the descriptive statistics. So if you were to go to analyze um, descriptive statistics uh, and then frequencies here, you can actually get um, those variables uh, here, or sorry, you can get those charts made right here. Um, however, if you want kind of more options and more advanced uh, graphs, it's better to actually go through the chart builder. So what you would click on is graphs, chart builder. Um, and then one of the things that it's always going to warn you about um, the first time you open it is that you wanna make sure that your data um, is uh, properly labeled so that your categorical variables are, cate are, are identified as being categorical and your continuous variables are um, identified as being uh, kind of on scale. Uh, so this is really important um, and it's going to prompt you the first time with a warning message and then after that you can click not to see it anymore. All right, um, so the first thing I'm going to show you is how to get the histogram. Uh, so the basic histogram, the one that you would get in the descriptive statistics output is uh, right here. So you can just kind of double click on it or you can drag and drop it. Um, and essentially, if you were to take uh, just one of your uh, or sorry, continuous variables, so uh, as a reminder, histograms are only really interesting for um, continuous data, okay? So not categorical data. And what you essentially do is just drag and drop it onto the x-axis. And since it's a histogram, what this means is that the y-axis is automatically just going to show the count um, for each variable. So if we don't do anything else, um, we're going to click uh, OK, and SPSS is going to generate our chart. Um, so as we can see here, uh, we've got kind of our distribution of scores, uh, as well as how many appear for each one. Um, so one thing, if you double click on here, um, you can get into the properties of the chart and some of the options, uh, you can add the labels if you would like. Um, so this now is going to say that it's count. So we can see the actual numbers of how many appear for each um, particular uh, frequency. So we can see that around 60, we have 26, um, etc. cetera. Uh, you can also... Um, you can move around where this appears. So you can do kind of custom that, uh, oops, I might've just broken it, um, or manual, you can move them around. Okay. But it, it doesn't really love that. But anyway, so it's kind of for your own, um, uh, kind of preferences. So another important thing to look at is this idea of binning. Um, so what this does is that it, it, SPSS will automatically kind of look at your distribution of data and lump scores that are similar together to kind of make the data more interpretable. So what this means is that this column here actually represents scores, um, between, uh, 95 and hundred percent, let's say, uh, and this one represents 90 to hundred and essentially, um, if you leave it on automatic, it's going to do that. But if you do it. Um, if you do it kind of custom, you can decide, okay, for example, right now there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 bins. Um, you might decide instead that we want to make it force into 10. So we apply that. And so now it's going to redistribute it so that there's only 10 categories. Um, another option is to instead go by the width of the bin. So what this means is that, okay, we only want it to represent one number each. So we're going to have, if we have a full range of a hundred, it means there would be a hundred of these. So if I click OK, do you see how it gets kind of like not interpretable? Because right now it's only showing, you know, this is the scores that are within like one numerical value. So it includes all the decimal points of, let's say, 18. Uh, and then this one here is like, let's say, 23, etc. So essentially you can kind of manipulate how interpretable this is based on the size of the bins. Um, so usually something like this, five uh, is pretty good, but we can see that there's gaps where, for example, there's no scores that happen to fall um, in between these values here. 
So really it's kind of up to you and how you want to display it. Um, but if you go back to uh, the default, SPSS will do this. Um, another uh, important thing to consider is what does uh, the uh, uh, y-axis represent? So we can see here that it's actually currently starting at 10 uh, and not zero. So this is something that you can fix uh, in here. If you double click on that and then go in here, you can actually change it so that the minimum is zero. Um, and then you can also put the, the major increments right now are set to five. So that's why we see 20, 25, et cetera. Uh, so maybe we can set that to three. Um, and then if you click apply, you can see how this kind of changes the look of the scale. Um, so now it starts at zero, or sorry, the graph rather, it changed the look of the graph, and now it starts uh, at zero. Um, so essentially these are all just kind of different customization options. Um, you can play with the labels, you can play with the chart size, uh, you can play with like the style of text. If you double click in here, um, you can play with the color, so of the fill, so for here we can make it, you know, we can make it blue, we can, you know, you can change the borders, like you have different customization options, you can make it wider. Um, but essentially, it's just kind of where you click and you can customize uh, the font uh, and what your uh, measure looks like. Uh, so histograms, again, are good for instances where you have a categorical variable and you just want to look at the distribution of scores in that, uh, on that particular variable. So another option, um, with the histogram is you can actually look at kind of two different categories, uh, so a variable with two categories, and then use that to look at two histograms at the same time. Um, so in this case, you can go back to Chart Builder, and this time, instead of selecting um, just the basic histogram, uh, you can pick one of the other options. Um, so just a quick note, this one here is the same as the one we just looked at. Um, the difference is that instead of showing things in columns, um, it actually just shows it. Oops, I actually forgot to, I didn't actually select it. Let's try that again. Sorry. So we double click it and now it's still showing this final grade score, but instead of showing it in bars, it just shows it um, in lines. So it's the same information, um, but just uh, in like line format instead of bar format. Anyway, um, so back to the chart builder. Um, so both of these options let you look at kind of different distributions of scores based on categories of variables. Uh, so this one is kind of interesting because it kind of flips the histogram. Um, so again, we want to put it final grade and then you just drag it there. And the split variable, we, you need to pick one with two categories in this case. So we could pick um, participant sex. And then once you've filled those both in, you click OK. And now essentially we have two histograms uh, that look like this. Um, so right now I must have, I have something in here that's not coded properly, which is why it's showing me this missing data. Uh, so don't worry about that. If you don't have that going on, it would just look kind of normal and you can see kind of how the frequencies fall for uh, both groups. Um, and I guess I should also undo that you can actually have this for multiple groups. It'll just show them all like this. Um, another option is if you want to look at different categories of people, um, is you can go back to the chart builder. And this time you can select this option. So if I double click on that, uh, so here again, we would put final grade on the X axis. And then th this time we would put our categorical variable up here. So I can pick this time like class attendance. Um, and then once you've set this stack set color as well as the final grade, and then it still says histogram here, you can click OK. And now we can see that the different categories are identified within um, that original histogram. So we can see that some people always attend class, that's the green. Um, these people sometimes attend and those people rarely attend, but we can see what the distributions of each uh, color now we'll look at making pie charts. Next, I'm gonna show you how to make a pie chart. Uh, so a pie chart is really only appropriate for one categorical variable, or if you were to make a few different pie charts, you could compare different categorical variables. Um, but essentially, these the goal of the pie chart is to show all the pieces of a whole. So you shouldn't be putting things in a pie chart that don't add up to 100%. 
Um, and so uh, usually, so basically the only examples you have are uh, categorical variables that should be used for pie charts. And then otherwise there's other ways you should be visualizing at if you don't have categorical variables. Um, so essentially same way we go, uh, so we go into charts, chart builder, um, we'll just reset everything here. Uh, so you can actually see um, all the different options down here, uh, but we want pi polar and essentially we would just drag and drop this here. And then um, you can uh, just put uh, one of the two categorical variables in here. So we can start with by putting um, gender. Um, okay, why didn't that work? Okay, and now it's going to show us uh, the count for each one. Uh, so just a note here, this isn't actually what your graph is going to look like. I meant to say this on the histogram as well. Um, but essentially, it's basically just um, the example of um, the, the, the default of the graph. So it's like, oh, this is what pi looks like, and you've moved one in. But once you actually click OK, it'll give you uh, a better visualization of it. Uh, so one thing you can, if you want uh, change here, is just the count to percentage um, or value or sum. But essentially, you should stick with one of these two. Um, and the percentage, I can't remember if it's going to, uh, oh yeah, let you know um, kind of like what options you have in terms of uh, like how it calculates the percentage. But it's easier just to stay with count and then it's automatically going to show it as a percentage anyway. Uh, so I'm going to click OK. Um, and now we can see our pie chart. Uh, so we can see that basically um, the pr groups are pretty even in terms of men and women. Um, so if you double click on the pie chart, this is where you can start to add different examples. So we can add um, the percentages if we want. Uh, you can um, you know, change the way that the numbers appear in terms of how many decimal points. So we can put zero and then suddenly we just have the overall percentage um you can this is just kind of a summary of what's in our data set uh you can change the colors so if i click on double click on that one i can make it actually like pink um oh wait that was the border sorry so to get to the fill you have to okay sorry close that and then click just on that and I don't know why it's not letting me change colors. Okay, so this lets me go into the more advanced version. Um, if I reset it, what is it doing? Okay, well, I'm not gonna waste your time right now playing with that, but basically you should be able to double click and change the color. Um, another thing that you can do here is kind of change how um, the pie pieces look, like if they're spread apart like this. Uh, if you go on depth and angle, you can also make it 3D. Um, but this is not really uh, recommended and you can also move kind of how far apart um, or how close the pie pieces are. Um, and then you can also kind of change the angle here. So as you know, this can kind of manipulate how big the groups look. Uh, you can also decide like where the first slice starts. So uh, like if it's with a clock, so we could say it actually starts at like four. So it's gonna rotate the pie. Um, like that. And then you can also, if you have multiple groups, this matters, change the order the groups appear, whether it goes this way around the circle or that way around the circle. Um, so just a thing to note, the pie chart is going to put the variables in order, like the categories in whatever numerical order you've assigned it. So if you've decided that, you know, men are one, women are two, and uh, prefer not to disclose are three, it's either going to go one, two, three, or one, two, three, depending on if you set counterclockwise or clockwise. Um, so essentially, this is how you would build your pie chart. Um, if you same uh, way, if you want to like change your titles and stuff, you would do that up here. Um, so I would click, you know, my pie chart. Um, you can add uh, another text box. Why did I get mad, mad? Sorry, you can add another text box if you'd like. Move that around. Um, and then you can add a footnote. So you have the options of adding text up above. And then you can also play with up here to make your graph bigger or smaller. Um, and if ever you screw something up, you want to undo it, you can just click on that and work backwards. So that is how you make um, a pie chart. And as a reminder, 
yeah, this looks terrible. Um, it is only applicable to categorical variables. Next, we'll look at bar charts. Okay, next I'm gonna show you how to make uh, bar charts. So these are actually pretty handy. Uh, so the first option is uh, we can uh, use a bar chart to represent the same thing as a pie chart. So this would be kind of the distribution of scores for a categorical variable. Um, so we'll use the example of class attendance. So what we'll do is we'll go to chart builder. Um, we'll reset everything. Uh, so this time we're going to go into bar. Um, you can see there's a bunch of different options, but the very first one I'm going to click on is just the basic one and we are going to put class attendance here and we can see that it has the default of count right here. So we'll click OK. And what we essentially get is the same information that we would get in a uh, histogram for a continuous variable. We get the number of participants um, per category uh, for a categorical variable. So this is also the same information that you would see in a pie chart. The difference is that it's no longer represented as like a percentage of the total population of this of this variable or total sample for this variable, but instead it just has the actual outright uh, count. Um, so that is the uh, kind of base option here. And then in similar case, you can click on it and then edit all the properties of it if you want. You can add the labels um, or like the, the count if you'd like, uh, but again, up to you. All right, so that is uh, the basic uh, bar chart. Um, so the next option is we can actually look at two categorical variables at the same time. Um, so what you would do to this is click on this kind of bar chart and actually we'll just reset it so we have that. So this time um, what you would do is you would pick one variable to go here along the x-axis and then the other one to be a cluster variable. Um, so essentially, I'm going to show you what it looks like both times, but it basically just flips kind of which one's in groups and which one isn't. Uh, so we have two categorical variables. So we'll put, let's start by putting sex up here, and then we're going to put class attendance here. So what this is going to let us look at is whether there are any kind of differences in trends between the two um, sexes, so male and female, on whether they always attend class, sometimes attend class, or rarely attend class. So again, um, this is not exactly what our data is gonna look like, it's just giving you a preview. So for example, we know right now that those are gonna appear there. Um, we can also actually switch this, put attendance up there, and then put sex down here, and now we can see that it's gonna compare men and women on the three types of attendance. So it's essentially the same information, it's just a question of how um, you want to uh, portray it. So we'll just start with this one. Um, so we click OK. And essentially what we're getting is the counts now. So it's the same information, but now we have it divided by uh, whether they attend class or not. So we can see the same stuff here. Um, and we can see that uh, the women tend, it looks like, without kind of having access to more information, it looks like there's like a bit of a pattern here where the women tend to be um, maybe attending class almost always, whereas maybe we're not seeing exactly the same pattern with the men. So we can also um, flip this and uh, look, sorry, go back to here. And we can, like I said, flip it so that sex now appears up here and that's the dividing variable and class attendance is uh, down here. So again, same information, it's just now flipped. Okay, so now we have always, sometimes, et cetera. And same thing, you can go in here and you can edit the properties of this and make the graph uh, more customizable or add information if you'd like. Um, so another option that we have um, for uh, charts or bar charts is you can look at kind of a continuous variable and a categorical variable at the same time. So if I reset this, we go in the same option here um, so this time, let's say we want to look at, um, you know, let's say total studying and we want to, oops, sorry, we want to, so sorry, we want to have a, um, a continuous variable, sorry, a continuous variable on the y-axis and then a categorical variable on the x-axis. So again, let's look at, um, we'll look at uh, sex, so we'll have male and female, 
And then what we want to look at is kind of total studying behavior. And we would put that here. So what this replaces it with are the frequencies. And instead, it's going to show us the mean of total studying. Um, so what this means, is it's going to show us how much men study and how much women study. Um, and then we have the option as well here to also uh, clarify that we're going to cluster on uh, the sex variable. We want to also put that there. So it's going to divide it. So once you've done, you've entered something here, here, and here, you can click OK. And now we're going to get our new table made. And what we can essentially see is that um, the women are, or sorry, the men are reporting about, you know, 42 hours of studying and the women are reporting, um, or sorry, uh, I don't know if this is in hours or minutes, let's say minutes. Uh, so 42 minutes and the women are reporting um, uh, closer to 30. So again, you can double click on here. You can change kind of all the characteristics, add labels if you'd like. Um, and then you can also add uh, another categorical variable. So we can look at, um, so if you don't want to just cluster it by uh, gender, you can also instead cluster it by, you know, do they attend class or not? And then also have the, the gender differences and still have um, mean scores here at the, for each column. Okay, so now we can see that we have, you know, how much time people who always attend class spend studying versus those who don't. And it doesn't necessarily mean these things uh, make sense, but it's just um, giving you kind of how you can uh, present the data. So one thing that's missing here um, is, uh, so, or do I want to show you anyway, is that we can change kind of what the graphs represent. So you have the options here to make it be the group median, um, it can be the mode, uh, the minimum score, the maximum score. And this is where you can really kind of play with your data if you want to, um, if you want to kind of skew it. So instead of representing the average of each group, we can change it to be the maximum number. And what we get instead is something that would look like this. So a similar graph, um, except now we have numbers well over 100 because we have people who, um, you know, that's the highest score in each group. So for the women that rarely attend class, the highest score on studying was like, say, 95. Um, and for the men who rarely attend class, the score, highest score was, let's say, 105, etc. So whereas in this graph, uh, what it's actually representing is the mean of the whole group. So that's how you can use data or use these graphs to kind of skew things a little bit. Um, another thing I do want to draw to your attention is that we can, again, play with the y-axis. Um, so you can do that by double-clicking on the y-axis, and then we can see here. So right now, if I put um, that the minimum is 60 and we apply it, like this group basically just disappears. So if we want to kind of artificially inflate the size of the differences here, I could put that, you know, this scale starts at 90, and now these look suddenly bigger. I can add... Um, you know, smaller increments. So making it just look like the difference is actually bigger than it is. Okay, so that's an option there. I'm going to close this. Um, and then the last thing that you want to pay attention to is something called uh, your error. Um, so once we're not representing just pure counts, so with the example of the histogram, um, the example of the pie chart, and then the first couple bar graphs I showed you, all that the, the y-axis represented was the number of observations or the number of scores we had kind of by category. Or um, in the example of a histogram, it was just telling you like how many people had a five, how many people had a six, how many people had a seven, etc. cetera. Um, but once this represents something else, whether it be kind of a mean or like a summary variable, we need to indicate some sort of extent of how much error there is on that variable. Um, so if I go back to uh, the chart builder, what we'll do is we'll actually just kind of run this again and keep it nice. Oh, so I'll put it back to mean. So if you recall, um, when we're learning about measures of, um, we're learning about descriptive statistics and measures of central tendency, so mean, uh, mode, and median, 
Um, we also wanted to look at kind of the shape of a distribution and have a sense of how much the scores vary or not. So if you recall mean, um, one way can, we can look at how scores vary around that is to look at um, the standard deviation. Um, we can also look at the standard error, which kind of takes into account the standard deviation, but also controls for the size of our sample. So if we have 10 people, we're going to have a much higher standard error than if we have 1,000 people. Or we can also put confidence intervals, which essentially kind of reflect um, the standard error, but just give us an idea of where we think that the actual true average would be if we didn't have any error or only like we're like that's kind of the easiest way to explain that so all this to say um we're gonna go back this is our regular graph with none of the, me screwing around with the side and i've made it back to being um the average so another thing that we need to do is if we're talking about representing a mean or a score here on the side or another variable we want to also make sure that we are displaying error bars and we have the choice of putting standard error, standard deviation, or the confidence intervals. And it doesn't matter which one you select, it's just important to make sure that you include one of them and then say in the um, legend of your graph what that represents. So um, I'm going to click uh, apply that here. And now we can suddenly see that we have uh, that error. So if we go with the confidence interval, it just means that this where the graph actually ends is the mean we have in our sample and then the top of the bot of the um top of the little line is here i'll just show you all right so we have our new one here so what this means is that okay so for this one here the mean is about uh let's say 18 and then we have this here kind of going from 19 to i don't know 16 i made those numbers up um, so we can see that this is relatively bigger. It's bigger than this one. So what it just means is that um, we have more variability in um, this sample than this one because there's more kind of error, sorry, around the mean. So what this means with the 95% confidence intervals is that we're pretty sure 95% of the time that the true mean, if we had no error, would be somewhere between this value and this value. So what this does is it just tells you kind of how much variability there is. And it's important to reflect this because what it really means looking at this is that these are basically the same. Okay, so those who attend class sometimes and those who don't, men and women, there's really no, really no difference um, in terms of how much studying they actually do. So even though the mean for men is slightly higher than the mean for women, it doesn't really matter because there's just so much measurement error in there. Um, we can see here that for the rarely group, um, you know, even though we observe a difference here, uh, the 95% confidence interval is telling us that, okay, this group has less variability in it, less error than this one. Um, but what's interesting here is that these, um, these two uh, have much smaller, a lot, lot less variability in them, so therefore the error is smaller. Um, but what's important to know is that if the error bars overlap with each other, it means that there isn't really any difference um, between the two groups. Uh, so it means that anything we're observing here is most likely just more like due to measurement error and not due to there actually being something different happening. And we'll learn how to analyze that uh, later in the semester, but for now it just means that, you know, these are pretty much the same. Um, but what's interesting about this particular graph is that this, if we were to look at these as a whole, and this one as a whole, we can see that there's basically overlap between these two groups. But even in considering the measurement error here, this group is obviously lower than both of these because the error graphs or the error bars do not overlap at all. So this just tells us that this group really is studying less um, than these two groups, but that these two groups, even though it looks different, basically study the same. So that was a kind of long-winded explanation of the error bars, but it's important to include them if um, what your y-axis represents is like a, is a mean score or a group uh, a group mean. Now we'll cover scatter plots. All right. So the last type of chart I'm going to show you is how to make a uh, scatter plot. So this is when you're looking at the relationship between two continuous variables. 
Uh, so again, we go here, uh, chart builder, um, we will reset everything and then scatter dot is down here. Uh, so you have the option of just doing kind of a traditional uh, scatter plot here where you look at two variables at the same time. Um, so perhaps we'll look at course satisfaction um, and uh, professor engagement. So um, it doesn't matter if you, unless you have a reason to believe which one is the cause and which one is the effect, um, it doesn't really matter if you're just looking at the relationship between two, which one is on the x-axis and which one's on the y-axis. However, if you know which one should be causing the other one, or that's um, the type of analysis you might run later, which again, we'll see later in the semester, you would put the one that causes things on the x-axis and the one that's being affected uh, on the y-axis. Um, so essentially, uh, we uh, this time are just looking at the actual value of the scores. So this is a little bit different than doing a bar um, chart where the mean rep or sorry the bar itself represents the mean. What we're interested in now right now in in now are people's individual scores and where they fall on the one variable at the same time as the other variable and kind of looking for trends there. So we leave it as value. So we can click OK. And essentially, we have something that looks like this. So what this means is that for this particular participant here, so that little dot, you can double click, and this is literally one person. So this participant, they scored about a, you know, 27, let's say, on course satisfaction. And then they reported that the professor was about a 5.1 in terms of course engagement. All right, so here in this particular example, the reason that the axis, like the, the uh, scale values are different is because the variables have uh, different ranges of scores. So this one here, professor engagement was measured on a one to seven. So the scores have to be somewhere between one and seven. Um, whereas this one, it was between zero and 35. Uh, so essentially the scale reflects that. If you would have two variables that were measured on Likert scale, you'd have one to seven here and one to seven on this side. Um, so it's important just to double check kind of what's happening uh, and make sure that it reflects what's actually in the data. So each of these dots represent a participant and it's their score on the one variable and like in this direction and then their score on the other variable in that direction. Um, so again, we have a few different options here. We can add a fit line. Um, so what this will do is kind of just show kind of what the average trend is for everyone. Um, and if you recall from high school, high school, y equals mx plus b, that's basically the formula of that line. So you can leave that there if you want. You can also um, remove this label. I just can't remember how and only have the fit line. Um, I need to find it. Oh yes, so you can take out the, or sorry, you can remove it right here, apply, and now there's no label um, on our line. So we just have that. Um, and then you can also, uh, sorry, you can customize the color of your chart and different things by just kind of clicking on the different sections uh, and adding um, information there as well. And again, same sections, you can kind of adjust the axis here. We can add more points if we want. So um, right now it's doing one to seven, but we could make the major increments to be 0.5. And what that would do is just add all the extras um, on the x-axis, same thing. Right now it's going up by five, um, but we could make it so that it goes up uh, by, you know, 2.5. Oh, sorry, still keep that, I guess, at five, but we could make the major increments to be 2.5. So instead we'll get something like this. Um, but again, it just kind of, it's, it's whether it's adding value from an interpretation perspective. Um, so if it's helping, you would keep it. If it's kind of skewing things and making it look um, false, then that's a problem. Um, so what we essentially have right here is core satisfaction and professor engagement. So if you were to, um, if you want, you can actually flip, and I forgot to show you this on the other scales, you can actually transpose the chart, which basically flips the X and Y axis. So if you click here, um, it's the same information, but now this is the one to seven and this is the one to 35. So it hasn't changed anything. It's just flipping it this way. And I forgot to show you that you can do that for all the other uh, charts I saw you as, or showed you as well. So that's right here. Okay, so we're back to our original one where the larger scales on this side and the smaller ones on this side. But again, I can flip it and maybe I'll just leave it like that. That's fine. All right. Um, so the next 
uh, thing I'm going to show you is sometimes you might actually want to look at two different groups of people. So a continuous variable, so two continuous variables, and then also look at kind of trends for groups uh, on a category. So let's, for example, let's say we want to do that. So instead of doing the simple scattered plot, we would do this one here that has multiple groups. And what I do is double click there. And all it's done is add this set color thing here. And what you need to do is add a categorical variable to set color. And once you've added that there, this should light up OK. And what we're going to see this time is that we have our still the same scatter of scores. Like these still look the same. Oops. Sorry. They still look the same in terms of how the scores are distributed. But now we can see that, OK, the rarelys are up here. The almost always are kind of down here. And the sometimes are there. Um, and we also, now that we have multiple groups, we can actually add that fit line. We can add it for everyone. Um, so I put it there, or I can not do that. So let's undo. Um, or I can actually add it for each group. So what we see are the three different groups, and we can see that they each have a bit of a different line. And I can remove those labels and click apply. And essentially what we're looking at now is the same uh, information, but we can see that, okay, the rarities, their relationship between core satisfaction and professor engagement kind of goes up really fast. Um, whereas the sometimes is a little bit more flat and then the almost always is a little bit is in between. So again, what do those lines mean? How to interpret that? You'll learn that later in the course, but you can see how you can uh, specify that. And again, same thing, we can flip it and it just um, changes what that relationship looks like. You can also, again, play with the axis, play with the colors, et cetera. And since I still have um, this opened here, I'll just quickly show you what this looks like flipped. Okay, so you can see same thing. So you can do that for all the graphs. Oops, I lost it. All right, so that is how you do uh, the um, scatter plot. And finally, I'll show you how to save your chart in SPSS. Okay, last thing I'm gonna show you is how to save uh, your graphs so that you can import them into other documents such as kind of PowerPoint presentations or into uh, Word documents, et cetera, or into Excel. So essentially, um, I personally find the easiest way is just to take a screenshot of it. Um, so that would be using that snipping or clipping tool on a Windows computer or um, just kind of the screen capture option on a Mac. Um, and then you can literally just dig, drag and drop it and get your graph that way. Um, the problem is that sometimes the resolution isn't great. Uh, so in that case, sometimes it's handy to, first of all, make your graph um, bigger. So I'm just, uh, where are the properties? Sorry. I'm looking for, oh, here. Sorry about that. Um, so this is where you want to put the chart size and you could, if you just, you know, make it bigger and bigger and bigger so that you have a higher quality image. So let's say I click apply. And then I'm going to also remove um, these labels. So now it's obviously getting angry because I have made it really big and there's a lot of information in there. Um, but essentially, yeah, I need to remove those um, and you kind of get the idea. So if, you, if you're finding the resolution is low, you just need to make it bigger. Um, I'm gonna close that. Okay, now it's massive. Um, and then another option is to actually just right click and actually export the document uh, directly. So you can um, determine kind of which file it's gonna go into. Uh, you can, um, and just export it immediately there. Um, you can also just turn it into um, a graphic file. So if you, oops. Um, so if you click graphics, you can actually just turn it, decide which image you want it in. Um, and again, you can make it 100% of the size that it is. You can just make it bigger here as well, um, but it kind of depends on your needs. And the same thing, this is going to show you that you just have to decide where you're gonna save it and what type of file you want of the image options. 
So that is how you would export your graph uh, once it's done. All right, thank you.